Bibles, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 3. That is the book we are currently in. Um, <clears throat> it's been a really sweet series. I have not spent much time in 1 Peter until this uh, season, and I have to say it's been really, really good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 8. I think we have it on the screen, no? Um, okay, thanks Shannon, sorry I just threw, you, threw that to you. I think it's there, for those of you, I think it's helpful, at least for me sometimes if I don't have my Bible, it's nice to be able to see the words in front of me. Okay, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Uh, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because it is to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers." But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are evil, eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who seek malicious, uh, speak maliciously against your behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins and the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. That's where we're going to pause this evening. Let's just, let's just pray. Lord, these are true and good and beautiful words. And we simply ask that our hearts would be open this evening, that we would hear your word even now as I'm speaking. Lord, I pray that you would be um, convicting us, that you would be drawing us, that we, you would be enlightening us, that you would be uh, um, giving us a hope and a future of just how beautiful and good this, this news really is, this call really is. And may we walk away um, transformed in, in true and deep and meaningful ways. Your word is living and active even if my words are not. And so we ask that you use your word tonight uh, to lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so... In the 18th century, uh, most of Europe was on fire, um, literally and figuratively. The Enlightenment ideologies of the day, um, as well as mass poverty um, throughout Europe, uh, as well as kind of that an ever-increasing gap between the majority rich and poor. Uh, you have the Catholic and Protestant kind of divisions and violence. And, and all of these factors, historians say, lead up to violent unrest and bloody revolution across the continent. It would later be called this kind of hundred-year-ish gap, the age of revolution, because such was the expanse of these kind of revolutionary tides. Um, that's also when our American Revolution took place. So it was this, this time in history, and we know the French Revolution, obviously that's pretty infamous, um, but across Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece under the Ottomans, po uh, Poland during this time ceases to exist for about 123 years. So that's how violent things got on the continent. Now, England at the time, and I'm acutely aware of how many Brits are in the room this evening, but uh, <laughs> let's just get my history right. But England at the time was suffering under pretty similar conditions. Um, there was a similar unrest. The Enlightenment era was taking place as much there as anywhere else. Um, the stats that I read said that 40%, on average, 40% of people were living on 14% of the national income, which equates to about 50% of the country living at or below poverty lines. Um, infant mortality was at an all-time high. In one particular year in the city of London, there were 
50,000 children born. Uh, five years later, only 40,000 of those children were still alive. So you, you, that equates to ina in, uh, inadequate health care, right? Um, inadequate family structures. There were literally gangs of orphans on the streets of London running things, um, as far as I can read. And so I could go on and on. And I'm saying all that to say England, like the rest of Europe, was ripe for bloody revolution. It never came or it came in a very different way. This is a quote. Um, I tried to get them on the screen, but Tyler's not here and I am not clever. So I'm going to read and just listen up. This is from Theta Scopel in an article entitled France, Russia, China, a Structural Analysis of Social Reform. This is what she said. This is an academic journal. Academics have identified certain factors that have mitigated the rise of revolutions. Many historians have held that the rise and spread of Methodism in Great Britain prevented the development of a revolution there. Because in addition to the preaching of the Christian gospel, John Wesley and his Methodist followers visited the imprisoned, cared for the poor and the aged. They built hospitals and dispensaries which provided free health care for the masses. Another sociologist, William Swatos, uh, stated that Methodist enthusiasm truly transformed men and women. Their practices of temperance, as well as their rejection of gambling, allowed them to eliminate, this is a historical text, allowed them to eliminate secondary poverty, and they accumulated capital, which they used on behalf of the impoverished. They took to industrial and political life to aid the working classes in non-revolutionary ways. Two more. Historian Bernard Semmel argues Methodism was an anti-revolutionary movement that succeeded to the extent it did because it was a revolution of a very different kind that was capable of affecting social change on a large scale. Last quote. Methodism assured the ultimate success of social reform by providing a method for non-violent change. Now, this is a cool story, but why am I reading it to you? Well, you see, this is the Cliff Notes version. They did so much more, but I think we would be hard-pressed to find a more embodied example of the text that we are getting into this evening. Here is a group of people Okay, John Wesley created these communities of people who personally and socially devoted their lives to the very things Peter is talking about. The sole design of Methodism, and these are the words of Wesley himself, was to be downright Bible Christians taking the Bible as interpreted by the church, the early church fathers, for their whole and sole rule to avoid evil, do good, and grow spiritually by the grace of God. And so when we get to a passage like this that calls for unity, humility, sympathy, love, compassion, speaking no evil, doing only good, pursuing peace, sharing hope, and I thought of the Methodists, I thought, there it is. There is the reality of a people who effected radical social change because what did they do? They did what God called us to do. They sought unity within the church and society. Meeting together was of the highest priority to the Methodists because they held each other accountable by showing up. They gave their time and energy to the poor, the impoverished, the orphaned, orphaned the imprisoned, high levels, uh, the sick. They lived simply so that they could use their money to care for others. They set up schools and free hospitals. They fought for the abolishment of slavery. These were people who went, this is what the Bible says we must do, and we are going to do it. And I want us this evening to have a conversation around this text with this story in mind. These are not trite Christian virtues. And I have to be honest, when I read my passage a few weeks ago, I was like, okay, like, be nice, love people, got it. And the more I sat with it, oh my gosh, I was so convicted by this passage because I realized, friends, if we do this, if we zealously pursue the thing that we are being called to, we can, it, it can be absolutely catastrophic in the best kind of way. Methodism started with three college students at Oxford, three 
And by the time Wesley died, I mean, I forget the stats now, but hundreds and thousands of people had met Jesus, but way more than that had be cared for, loved for, aided so to the extent that historians, secular historians will say revolution never came because people did this. That is beautiful. And in a day and age like ours where there is so much unrest, we need to press into these truths even more. <laughs> so what we're going to do quite simply we are going to take this passage line by line, charge by charge this evening, and we are hopefully going to allow ourselves to be personally convicted, deep personal revelation to take place so that we can be the community that Peter and God are calling us to be. Sound good? Okay, so two portions to this kind of passage. The first section, if you notice, is what I'm going to call the being section. Um, Wesley would probably call it the personal section. He used personal and social. So the first is being, i.e. my internal being, my mind, my heart, my soul, my body, uh, my feelings, my emotions. And then Peter is going to move us into the external behaviors portion, i.e. what I say or what I don't say, what I do or what I don't do. Now, really quickly, just a reminder, okay, lest we forget the grace that we have received. Peter has spent multiple chapters now, and I'm quoting, saying, you are chosen. You have been sanctified. You are newly resurrected through Jesus. You have been called. You have been empowered to holiness. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God. And so when Peter says, now be holy because he who called you is holy, what he is saying is you have everything you need because of the blood, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus to actually be holy. And so this isn't about salvation by works. This is the work of grace. This is what it looks like. We live into the reality of him who has made us holy. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is intentionally exerting every effort in my physical, internal makeup to do the things to which I have been called. So... All of us, right? That's how he begins finally to all of you. That means you and me and you and me and you and me and a lot of us, okay? What does he say? Firstly, be like-minded. Be of one mind. It's interesting that Peter starts here. He speaks about the mind and he speaks about the unity of the church. You know, most of us are okay with uh, one mind if, if one mind is the mind I like. You know what I mean? If one mind is my mind, I'm okay. Uh, if, if, if it's what I think, then I'm okay with it, all right? But spoiler alert, that's not what he's talking about. What mind is he talking about? Be of one mind. It's the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. In the same passage, Paul says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but it is not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified him. Far too often when it comes to our minds, what we want to do, what I am guilty of, is I take the ideologies I like my opinions, my perspectives, the things that suit me. And then I take theology and I try to create the sort of intellectual universe in which all the things that I want can still be true. But that's not the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is my thoughts, my perspectives, my preferences, the, the opinions of the age, right? All of these things are suspended as I adopt the mind of Christ. That means what Jesus prioritized, I prioritize. That means what Jesus gave his time to, I give my time to. That means my thought life is dictated and fashioned by him. And when that is the case, you and I as the church can be unified as one body because each and every one of us is submitting ourselves to the mind of Christ. And so we are unified not by common interests, not by age, not by politics, not by race, not by economic standards. We are joined together. We are unified by the thoughts and deeds of Jesus. 
Second thing, be sympathetic. This is a feeling word. Uh, Peter uses sympathy and compassion, and so I kind of dug into those a little bit. This has to do with the ability to identify with what others are going through. Able to sit in their pain, in their disappointments, in their celebrations. They got a job you didn't. This is what this is speaking about. Be sympathetic. I am not a naturally sympathetic person, I've realized. I do not like negative emotion. I don't want to sit there. I want to fix it and make things better. And my feelings are not naturally directed. My husband is nodding. Uh, thanks, babe. Uh, <laughs> um, but this is what's so beautiful about this, guys, is in Jesus, okay, we are called to be things, to feel things, to emote things that are not naturally true to us. Now, we can see that as being inauthentic, but here's how it is the most authentic thing, is that who we are truly from the beginning of creation is a child or children of God. Who I am from the very start, from the very moment I take a breath, I am a daughter of the Most High God. That is authentically who I am. And I can choose to engage with that identity. I can choose to engage with what God has called me to, or I can choose not to. And that's up to me. But in Christ, I have access to not only my feelings, but his. In Christ, I have access to not only my mind, which all of its baggage and brokenness, but I have access to his. I have access to the holiness and perfection that my heart and my soul and my mind so long for because that's what he intended for me from the beginning. And he's saying, here it is, take it. And you know what? When I struggle to find sympathy for others, I remember the, the words of Jesus, we have a savior who was what? Acquainted with our suffering. So when in my own flesh I struggle to, to connect on that level, I am allowed to go, Jesus, you know what this person is experiencing. You know the depth of their sorrow. Won't you help me to be with them in this moment? Thirdly, be loving. Here it is. Love people. This is the foundation. You know what's interesting is this passage, though, I want us to realize, is firstly about loving the church. Most of the translations will say um, love as like brotherly love. And they're speaking about within the context of the body. Yes, we love our neighbors, but Peter is calling us to love the church, which is sometimes harder. It is more challenging, right? And yet, that is what he is calling us into. Not, I will point out, this doesn't say be loved. I'm walking into church. Who's going to love me? Who's going to take care of me? Who's going to meet my needs? No, no, no. Be loving. What does it mean to be loving? Love is what? Patient. It never gives up. Love cares for others more than ourselves. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. It's not jealous. It doesn't want what other people have. Well, I, I can't be with that person because X, Y, and Z. Love isn't proud. Love doesn't arrive thinking that everyone's going to serve them. Everyone's going to cater to them. Love isn't always me first. Love isn't angry. Love is loving. That was, love is loving. Get it? Okay. Love doesn't keep score of sins, particularly in the church. Friends, this is super important because some of us, look, the church is not ideal, okay, at all of the time. But some of us keep records of wrong. And I want to say with all sympathy in my heart that that is not what we are being called to be. Love keeps no record of wrong. When Peter says, be loving, he is calling us to let it go. Even if they won't rectify with you, Jesus can reconcile that heart. Jesus can reconcile that pain. Jesus can sit with you in it and, and, and transform the innermost part of your being. Love never gives up, friends. This is brutal and hard and beautiful. This is what I sat with this week and thought, man, Imagine if in community, I weighed every word, every action, every thought against this list. Is this patient? Is this kind? Is this full of forgiveness? Is this full of the benefit of the doubt? Is this full of generosity? Imagine what that would look like. All right, let's keep going. Be compassionate. This is about consideration. 
Am I concerned about others? Do I spend all my time spiritually concerned about myself? Or am I looking for ways to help and aid and come alongside? Is my prayer life only filled with my own needs? Or is it filled with the compassion for others, the consideration for others? This is an intentional, active state of being where I consider I have compassion for my community. Wesley actually preached uh, and, and was such a firm believer. This is his words. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social religion, no holiness but social hol holiness. He believed that we could not grow as Christian community without being surrounded by people. Why? Because it is only here that we get to practice unity, that we get to really enact sympathy, love, compassion. It happens here first. If we can't do it here, we are never going to be the embodiment of what Jesus is calling us to be out there. And finally, right, in our state of being, we are being called to be humble. Friends, it is in Christian community that we learn that we are not always right, that I am not always right, that I am not always the most important, the best, the most deserving, it is here that I learn how to defer to others, how to prefer others, how to think more of them and myself. It's here that I show up ready to give and not just receive. And this goes back to chapter one because, friends, when we recognize that everything we are is a product of the goodness and grace of God, that I am dust brought to life, sustained by his breath, redeemed by his body. You know what? When I understand that I am the design of God, the, the redemption of God, then I can come into community and recognize that all that is good and true and beautiful about me as a human is about him. So I have nothing to be proud about. This isn't about thinking lowly about us. This is about recognizing that I am a living, breathing work of God. And so if I boast in anything, what does Paul say? I boast in him. His mind, his sympathy, his love, his compassion, his humility. That is the being state that we are called into. And then from that being flows a righteous kind of living. This is a regenerative process, as Wesley called it. It cannot come just from an outward place, but it definitely needs an outward expression where my actions reflect the hope to which I have been called. So what does he say? Looking back at our text. Firstly, we are called to Repay evil with a blessing. Whew. Think about that. Think about the last time someone said something bad about you, did something harmful. Was your response to get on your knees and pray blessing over them? Mine wasn't. Mine was to get on my knees and go, God, my husband is a pain in the butt. No, just, I mean, I would never, but that's probably might have happened. Um, <laughs> But what I am called to here, just honey, cover your ears real quick. Um, what I am called to here is get on my knees and pray blessing. Play the goodness of God. Think about, think about Jesus on the cross. Everyone has left him. Everyone has deserted him. He has been wrongly accused. He is dying. He has been beaten and bludgeoned, and he is literally about to breathe his last breath. And what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Nothing that ever happens to us will be as bad as that. And so, friends, we have to learn how to give blessing even to those who we feel don't deserve it because, friends, he did that for us. He never asks anything of us that he does not already do himself. Secondly, keep your tongues from evil or deceitful speech. I have a kid now. I have two kids now. It's happened very quickly. Um, COVID is a weird time. And uh, <laughs> just two kids just slipped on in there. And uh, this, is, this is my point, is that I am suddenly so aware of the effect that what I say has. Because my two-year-old, whatever I say to him, he will turn around and tell his nine-month-old sister with utter conviction. And it's this silly example, but I all the time I go, oh my gosh, that's me. 
he just did exactly what I did. And I am seeing the effects of my words in a little human. And I think sometimes I wish all of us could see the effects of our words in a little human. Because we would hold our tongue a lot more. We would find a lot more grace. We would stop speaking evil because that little human is going to turn around and do exactly the same thing. I feel, like the, I feel like God is calling us to learn how to weigh our words again. Friends, let's be wary, especially in community, of speaking truth at the expense of others. In community, we are at risk of being very unguarded with our tongues. Oh, I just have to get this off my chest when really we're gossiping. Oh, oh, I, I was just joking. No, no, that was harsh. And that was meant to undercut and that was meant to dig in. No, no, no. Keep your tongues from evil. All right, moving along because I'm on a clock. Do good. Do good, right? Turn away from evil and do good. Being a Christian, being the embodiment of Jesus is not simply, and it's hard enough, but it's not simply not sinning. Oh, I just, I didn't do any bad things. No, no, no. We are called to turn from evil and do good. This is what the Methodists did so profoundly. They were passionate about doing good. They were serving those in need. They were creating social change, education, health care, political reform. They didn't just not gamble. They took the money that they had from living simply and they spent it on behalf of others. Imagine if every, every one of our actions was filtered through this lens. Is this doing good? Am I choosing to be a reverberation of the goodness of God on this earth, or am I detracting from it? Do good. Finally, uh, no, I got two left. Ooh, okay. Finally, seek peace. In the same way as doing good, this is an active call be zealous, some translations say, for peace. This is go out and find ways that you can be a peacemaker. In your city, in your work, in your family, are you relationally a peacemaker? Are you spiritually a peacemaker? Do you like to stir things up? Or do you want to bring reconciliation? Find ways to bring peace. Lastly, what does he say? And I love this. Uh, oh, I'm going to look out of my notes. Share your hope with gentleness and respect. I love that Peter assumes followers of Jesus will be asked about their hope, right? Because if we're doing all these things, people are going to notice. And then he says, if, it's going to happen, so be ready. And he says, firstly, be ready. So know what you believe. Know the hope to which you have been called. And secondly, do it with gentleness and respect. You don't need to be defensive. Jesus isn't insecure. He knows who he is. He knows what he's done. And we get to share that with gentleness and respect. Don't be defensive, but equally, friends, don't be passive. On this point, I think we have overcorrected. We have been so afraid of the person on the sidewalk with the sign that says, you're going to hell, which is the worst. It's the exact opposite of this. But the pendulum has swung, and so in an effort to not be arrogant, we've become silent. In an effort to not be offensive, we've lost conviction. In an effort to not be hypocrites, we've become apathetic. Well, it doesn't really matter if I'm... We don't want to kind of Bible bash, and so statistics show that we've just stopped reading our Bible. We've just stopped engaging with the Word of God. And friends, I think it is possible to be radically gracious, radically peaceful, to be the type of people that are zealous and passionate about creating good and beauty in this world and to do it full of conviction. And even when we are persecuted and criticized for it, the Methodists were criticized for all the good that they did. They were criticized. So it's going to happen. But when you suffer, Peter says, at least it is for doing good. We won't be criticized for all the things the church has done wrong. We will be criticized for, I don't know, those Christians pray for too many people. They're too active in society. They're taking over, you know, whatever it is. Let's be criticized for doing good. This is where Peter lands it. Even if we should suffer for what is right, 
for pursuing peace and goodness. He says, we are blessed. We inherit a blessing. And notice, friends, blessing doesn't mean we won't suffer. Peter joins them together, suffering and blessing. It doesn't mean that you won't be misunderstood. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be kind of perfect and laid out and I'm always going to get the job I want or this I want. What it means, friends, is that we will have the presence of God. It says he will attune his ear to our prayers. He will listen. He will be with you. He will guide your steps. And it is because of him we do not have to fear. The blessing is the presence of God, the deep inner knowing that I am exactly who God has called me to be and I am partnering with him in bringing goodness and truth and beauty into this world. That is the blessing of God. And friends, if we will live into the reality of what he is calling us to, we will experience what the psalmist says, the good days with Jesus here and now. To this we have been called. I was deeply challenged when I realized how surface, how how surfacey I am comfortable being when it comes to the call of Jesus. Reading the Bible, showing up on a Sunday, going to home group. And Sue and I had a conversation yesterday about like, man, we want to be way more radically generous We want to be way more, um, what's the word, intentional about doing good. We want to be way more active in the areas that God is calling us to. Because it's to this we have been called. I'm going to ask um, Austin to come up. I wrestled with kind of um, how to land it or or what. And I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm practical by nature. And so this is what I'd like us to do. We're going to take a moment. Austin's just going to play. And really that's just because there's, it's not like extra spiritual. It's just to help us focus in. But I want you to take a moment. And I want you to reflect on these 10 things, right? And I want you to ask the Spirit of God to, to direct you towards one or two of them. God, what can I, what are you calling me into Is it a state of being? Is it a state of doing? Are there areas of my life that you are highlighting? So we're just going to take a minute or two, see what the Spirit of God says to you, and then I'm going to ask us to turn to one or two people around us, and we're just going to pray together. We're going to allow the truth of God that we might be, what did he say? That we might be unified, that we might be sympathetic, that we might be loving, compassionate, humble, that we would be the type of people who give blessings, who speak kindly, who do good, who seek peace, and who have a hope and a conviction that is lathered in gentleness and respect. Can we do that? Let's take a minute. Spirit of God, you are here. You are speaking. Won't you in the loving way that only you can, won't you convict us right now? Won't you draw us into more of that which you intended for us? 